Hi, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you all. Good afternoon. Uh, it's great to have so many of you joining us today. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, me, I'm Emily Beauregard. I'm the director of Kentucky Voices for Health and a member of the Thrive Kentucky campaign. And um, I hope everyone here got to enjoy the long weekend and take a break on Labor Day. As always, we have a lot of updates for you on state and federal policies and everything that you need to know about the status of Kentucky's safety net programs. I know most of you are familiar by now with Thrive Kentucky, uh, but for anyone who's joining us for the first time, our mission is to meet the basic needs of every Kentuckian through systemic change, because we recognize that many of our fellow Kentuckians face historical and systemic barriers to meeting their basic needs. And we have some guiding principles that I'm trying to pull back up my slide that you can see here on this slide. Uh, and if you move on to the next slide, Alex, this is our list of Thrive Kentucky partner organizations. And if you're interested in learning more about any of our orgs, um, you're welcome to, you'll get the slide deck and you can click on these links um, to learn more about us. You can go to the next slide. Um, we always wanna thank our sponsors for supporting this work. It helps us to um, put these webinars on on a monthly basis. We also do an in-person roadshow once a month. Um, some of you have attended that. Some of you may be um, registered to attend an upcoming event, and we'll share more information about um, those upcoming dates and what we're going to be covering during our roadshow. But um, as for our sponsors, we just really appreciate their support so that we can make these webinars and the roadshow stops free, um, cover the CEUs for social workers and community health workers, and uh, make sure that we can offer you some fun swag whenever you come to our in-person meetings. So um, for our roadshow locations, you can see here the remaining um, three are going to be September 19th, October 17th, and November 28th, Louisville, Lexington, and Paducah. Um, so hope to see some of you there and please share that information with any of your colleagues who you think may want to attend. Um, and these are just a little bit longer than what we do on a monthly basis and include advocacy training in addition to all the other state and federal policies that we like to cover. And go to the next slide. This is the agenda for today's meeting. Um, we're going to be covering a lot of topics like we normally do, um, sharing some important updates with you and some very timely updates um, about what's happening during the interim session, getting ready for um, voting this fall, and lots of other things. And uh, just some housekeeping before we move on to our first topic. Uh, we have a lot of folks on the call today, so please um, keep your line muted. Uh, we will, and you can put questions or comments in the chat as we go. We think that works better than waiting until the end of the presentation. So we'll um, keep an eye on that chat and make sure that we address anything that we can. If we get you know, extra questions or if there's something that we can't answer immediately, We'll include that in the follow-up. We will send out the recording, the slide deck, and any other materials that we talk about today in a follow-up email that um, will come out tomorrow. So you can um, keep an eye out for that. And uh, if you are a, a certified community health worker or a social worker and would like CEUs for today, reach out to Kelly Talby, who I think Kelly will put her email address in the chat. She hasn't already. There it is. Um, and she can help you with that. And let's move on. So we're gonna kick it off with Dr. Schuster. Good afternoon and thank you, Emily. So uh, I'm Sheila Schuster, I'm a licensed psychologist and chair of the board of Kentucky Voices for Health. And I'm gonna cover a wide range of uh, kind of legislatively related topics. Uh, next slide, please, Alex. So you've heard us talk before about um, the uh, enhanced benefits for adult uh, members of Medicaid to improve vision, hearing, and dental issues. Um, this was announced in July of 2022 by the governor, and the programs began in January of 2023. Uh, there was no additional sign-up or anything needed by Medicaid members, but they did were able to get uh, vision exams and eyeglasses or contacts, hearing exams and hearing aids, additional dental visits, including even dentures, root canals, fillings, or extractions as needed. Uh, the, there's been a bit of a back and forth between the administrative uh, or executive branch and the legislature, and they passed Senate Bill 65, 
to end the program unless new regs could be approved. But um, there are now emergency regs that are in effect. And essentially what you need to know is that these benefits are still in effect at least to the end of this calendar year. And we're hoping that they will be continued uh, on into 2024 and beyond. There is a, a, a legislative hearing in front of the Administrative Regulation Review Subcommittee called ARRS on September 12th. So if you have a personal story or a comment uh, about being able to access some of these expanded services and why they are were important to you, you can contact Kelly at Kentucky Voices for Help. But remember that these are in effect and you should be accessing them if you have any of those issues. Next, please, Alex. So just a reminder that we finished a short, seems like it went on forever, 30-day session on March 30th. There were 33 newly elected legislators. Um, Cassie Armstrong, Senator from Louisville, was elected in February. And then we have a new legislator, uh, now Senator Greg Elkins from Winchester, who was elected in May to fill Senator Alvarado's seat. Uh, there were nearly 900 bills filed with 175 of them becoming law and all now have become law. There's a, a part of Senate Bill 150 that is still being contested in the courts. That's um, access to health care by uh, trans youth, uh, and that still is undecided. But your best source of information for any of these bills is the LRC website, which we have there for you. Next, please, Alex. So just a reminder that there are 38 members of the Kentucky Senate, 31 are Republicans and seven are Democrats. Uh, there should be 100 members in the Kentucky House, but right now we are short one as sadly, uh, Representative Lamine Swan, uh, recently uh, elected in a new district in Lexington, passed away after the session, and his seat will be filled uh, at, at the time of the general election, which is November 7th. So be on the lookout. If you were represented by Representative Swan, then you have a choice of um, candidates in this upcoming election. Uh, next, please, Alex. So the interim session is going on and the interim has gotten busier and busier every year. I've been going to Frankfurt for 45 years and it used to be first there was no interim session and then for a while it was, they would get together occasionally and talk about bills that didn't pass in the previous session. But it has really gotten to be very busy these days. Um, the uh, House and Senate committees meet jointly once a month. So for instance, the House Health Services Committee chaired by um, Representative Moser and the Senate Health Services Committee, uh, chaired by Senator Meredith, instead of meeting separately, meet jointly once a month. So it's a great opportunity to vet an issue with both chambers at the same time. And then I wanna pay, pay special attention to uh, special committees known as task forces, because some of these are of particular interest to some of us in the Thrive um, Coalition. Next, please. So these are the seven interim task forces. You can see here, there's one on health and human services, delivery, school and campus security, jail and corrections reform, certificate of need, the lottery trust fund, the local government annexation, and the multimodal freight transportation system improvement. I guess they win the prize for having the longest and most complicated title. So they meet uh, pretty much monthly during the interim session, and then they will have recommendations filed with the Legislative Research Commission no later than December 4th. And very often those recommendations have to do with actions that they're recommending be taken in the upcoming 2024 session. Next, please, Alex. So three that are of particular interest. One, it has to do with the certificate of need, which you may have heard about, um, it exists in Kentucky and in one form or another in most other states, but um, the process has been under intense scrutiny during this interim session and actually before that. There are voices on both sides of the issue, some arguing that we need um, CON to make sure that um, uh, there's not a, uh, an overabundance of services or um, uh, turf wars 
On the other hand, there are those that say it really is just a um, an unnecessary barrier to getting needed services. So I call your attention particularly to the meeting that's coming up on September 18th at 10.30 when the case will be made for removing certificate of need, which has been a barrier for the past almost 10 years for establishing freestanding birthing centers in Kentucky. Kentucky is one of only, I think, six states that do not have any freestanding birthing centers. And it's been a request of many um, moms in Kentucky some of whom travel to Indiana, Southern Indiana, or to um, the Nashville area to use birthing centers there. Um, the School and Campus Safety Task Force is also a particular interest if you're concerned about student mental health because it actually is focusing on that. The next meeting is on September 19th at 2 p.m. and we'll have presentations from the Community Mental Health Centers as well as a discussion on how to make schools more trauma-informed to bolster safety and resilience among the students and staff. And then the third one that's of interest to many of us because we follow what happens with Medicaid and with public health and with the Department for Aging and Independent Living, the Department for Behavioral Health, all of those, of course, are in the Cabinet for Health and Family Services. So there's a task force to look at uh, the services and how they're delivered. And it has heard testimony from providers, consumers, and advocates with concerns and recommendations. So I um, uh, invite you to uh, either attend in person on September 26th at 3. I also have put the links there. Uh, will either be televised on KET or more likely on the LRC YouTube channel. But you can watch those live or you could go back and find them archived and watch the uh, action um, after the fact. Next, please, Alex. So, uh, you know, I think all of these ways to stay in touch with policymakers, uh, you could check the website to make sure you know who your legislators are. And you could also look up the materials for any of the task forces or any of the committee meetings. Um, I would always suggest that you follow up any contact you have with legislators by thanking them. These are part-time legislators. None of them are getting filthy rich doing this work. So if they give you some extra time or meet with you and so forth, uh, always a good idea to thank them for their time. Um, th this is the way to reach them by email and also to um, call their office in uh, Frankfurt and you can get to know their legislative assistant that way or you could write them with snail mail and send it to them in their annex room. You can also email the governor by using this link. Next, please, Alex. And just a final thing, a reminder that 2023 is an important election year. If you watch television at all or listen to the radio, um, hasn't hit the newspapers so much, but there are lots and lots of ads on all sides, particularly around the governor's race. Kentucky is one of only three states that is having statewide elections um, this year. So lots of focus. We also are a state, obviously, where the administration or executive branch is Democratic and the legislative branch is Republican. Uh, just a reminder that the registration deadline for November 7th is October 10th. Very easy to go to www.govoteky.com and check your registration or change it. And I've listed the slate of candidates for you there. And remember that the um, special election to fill the um, House District 93 in Fayette County is also going to be on that ballot. So if you live in House District 93, you will have a chance to vote. So remember that elections have consequences. And uh, as I always say, democracy requires not only your voice, but your vote. And I think I'm at the end of my slides. And I'm happy to turn it over to my colleague, Dustin Pugel at Kentucky Policy. Thanks, Dr. Schuster. Um, Dustin Pugel here with the Kentucky Center for Economic Policy. We're a nonpartisan nonprofit research and advocacy group uh, and enthusiastic members of the Thrive Kentucky campaign. Um, so Sheila just set up our context really real well, our legislative sort of policy landscape. Um, and we also like to start with sort of an economic landscape because the degree to which 
folks need help with food and housing and health care really depends on how well they're doing uh, in the broader economy. So uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. Uh, so I think folks have been hearing uh, a lot lately that we have been adding uh, many jobs to our labor force. That's been true nationally and certainly true here in Kentucky. Um, this line graph, I think, is a great just sort of benchmark for how we're doing now compared to how we've done in previous recessions, like that long, dark line there is the, the Great Recession, the light blue line above it, sort of the dot-com bust uh, from 2001. You can see with this yellow line, we've lost a lot of jobs very quickly, but we've also regained them more quickly than we lost uh, or than we regained jobs in the last couple of recessions. Um, we've actually brought back 350,000 out of the 294,000 jobs that we lost uh, since the low point in April 2020, um, which means it took us about uh, half the amount of time to recover from this than it did from the Great Recession. Uh, we're now about 2.9% above where we were before uh, the recession hit due to COVID-19. And that's due to a lot of things, but I think uh, in large part, it's due to the fact that there was a lot of federal money that came into Kentucky uh, through unemployment benefits, stimulus checks, um, through Medicaid and, and other things. And those really helped make sure that there was uh, enough money around to, for people to continue paying their bills, which meant that other people could stay on the job. So higher demand meant a faster recovery. And, and I think that's a really important lesson for us to take forward um, for the next one. So let's move on to the next slide. And it's not just that we've had a good recovery compared to previous years. We've actually caught up to where we would have been had nothing happened. So this chart kind of shows what happened with real jobs, sort of that blue, uh, blue area there versus what would have happened had we just sort of chugged along uh, with no change and just kept a population adjusted workforce. And, and we're actually above where we would have uh, found ourselves had nothing happened about by about 35,000 jobs. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone's still in the labor force. Kentucky still has a, a lower labor force participation than some states. Uh, and that's by and large due to the fact that we have a lot of folks who are retiring finally, particularly folks who are over 75 years old. So folks who have been long overdue for retirement um, and a lot of folks who are caregiving, caregiving for uh, uh, older or disabled or sick loved ones, um, but also a lot of parents who are continuing to care for uh, their children. We'll have more to say about that here in a little bit. And of course, there's there's also folks who are just missing from our labor force that, that might have been around before COVID-19, particularly uh, we have fewer immigrants coming into the state um, due to federal immigration policies that are restricting folks coming into the Commonwealth, as well as, unfortunately, a lot of folks just passing away from COVID who may have otherwise been um, on the job. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, we also have good news in that folks are not being laid off <laughs> and, and by a large degree. So this blue line here kind of shows what was happening with unemployment benefits. Remember, unemployment benefits only go to folks who have been laid off through no fault of their own. Their employer just had business that dried up. They couldn't afford to keep people on. They laid them off. They were fine employees. They just couldn't keep them. And that's really not happening in large numbers. So if you think about continued claims as folks who need more than one week of benefits, it's about a third, a quarter uh, of what we were experiencing before the pandemic. And initial claims of so folks just saying initially, I think I qualify for unemployment benefits. I need some help right now. It's right around half. So we're really uh, seeing a remarkable and historic level of um, uh, employment right now. And, and very, very few folks are losing their jobs, which is great. So let's move on to the next slide. While having a job is super important, um, it, that paycheck can get chewed up by inflation, as we know. So. Uh, folks have seen, I'm sure, in their own personal lives, as well as on the news, that things cost a lot more than they did a couple of years ago. Um, there's more good news on this front, too. We are now, uh, I think, it, I, on every measure, really, we have turned the corner on rapidly increasing prices. Now, prices are still going up. They're just not going up as fast as they were. So, for example, if you look at price increases for all items in all parts of the country, um, it peaked at about 9.1% in June of 22. Um, right now, we're at about 3.2%. Oh, I like that cursor movement. Thanks. Thanks for doing that. Uh, you know, food, for example, which is something I think we've all really felt, that peaked at about 11.4% in August of last year. 
uh, we're now down to under 5%. So 5% is still pretty hot. Uh, it's, and we're all feeling that, but it's not nearly where it was before. And I think it's headed in the right direction for sure. Um, and the other good news about this is that uh, inflation adjusted wages are actually rising, uh, which is good because you know it's one thing to say, well, I'm getting more than I was last year, but stuff's so much more expensive, it doesn't really matter. We're actually seeing that folks' paychecks are rising in real terms. So even faster than inflation, which, which is important to improve the standard of living because Kentucky's a poor state. Uh, we know that uh, a lot of folks here can't make ends meet. So anytime we can actually improve wages above what prices are doing, generally speaking, is going to be uh, an improvement for things like the poverty level, well-being, uh, and the overall economy. So let's move on to the next slide. Now, one wage that hasn't uh, risen for a long time is our minimum wage. So the minimum wage is our, our wage floor, right? It's supposed to be this idea that nobody makes less than, than this amount. Um, and unfortunately, because of rising prices, which happens every year, uh, we now have the lowest minimum wage than we've had since any point uh, going back to the Eisenhower administration right after World War II in 1950. So uh, we are we are well off the peak of almost $14 an hour that we saw in 1968. Um, and it's just going down because we have now gone 14 years uh, as of July without raising our minimum wage. Uh, and that's longer than we've ever gone since it was instituted in 1938. So We've got a really, really long time, way too long without increasing that. There are dozens of other states in D.C. that have increased their minimum wages, uh, including up to $17 an hour in Washington state. Um, and we're not one of them. So uh, this is something that needs to change congressionally. But it's something that if our legislature wanted to do, uh, they could change in an instant. So it's something that we really need to fix. If we were to raise our minimum wage, say, to $15 an hour, for example, which still isn't even quite enough to live off of for some family compositions, we'd have about 300,000 workers uh, get a raise from that, uh, which is around 15% of our workforce. That, that, that would be significant and it would help a lot of people. Uh, so let's move on to the next slide. Um, so we talked a little bit about the economy. I wanna shift real quick and talk about our, our uh, income tax. Um, this is also something that's been in the news a lot lately. Um, the legislature has uh, stated a, a desire to uh, move toward a 0% income tax uh, over however many years. And um, we think that's problematic, especially because the income tax uh, has historically been our best source of revenue for paying for all the things we're going to talk about today, child care, health care, housing, um, and so forth. Uh, and so chipping away at that is, is a problem. Um, as of Fiscal year 2023, which just ended back in June, it represented about $5.8 billion, which is about 39% of our total general fund uh, in the state. It's a single largest source of revenue. And it's also a source of revenue that grows better than other types of revenue because wages at the top tend to rise more quickly than other areas of the economy. And so as those rise, we're actually taxing those at a, at a, um, a certain amount. So we're able to capture a lot of the growth that's going on in our economy. So let's move on to the next slide. Unfortunately, uh, and I've titled this slide, the, the plan to run out of money, uh, because uh, unfortunately in the last couple of years, the legislature had passed uh, two bills, one setting up a system of cuts um, so long as two measures are met, and I'll talk about those in a second. And then uh, this past year, a decision to go ahead and cut it another half percentage point. Um, every half percent cut, uh, in our um, income tax represents, um, a, I said 800 million here, that's in the future, but represents about uh, between 600 and 700 million dollars. Um, so it's a small percentage, but it's a lot of money. Um, and in order for the legislature to do that, they have to meet two conditions. The first is gonna have 10% or more in our, in our um, budget reserve trust fund, sometimes called our uh, rainy day fund. So 10% of the total general fund in, in that bank account. Uh, the second is that general fund receipts or our tax revenue that we bring in from all sources have to equal what we're spending plus uh, the cost of a one percentage point reduction in the income tax. So two, two conditions, one, have enough in our savings and two, bring enough in to pay our bills plus a little extra. That is that creates sort of a uh, a double bind, if you will, it creates some some incentives toward not spending one by 
encouraging the legislature to put more money in our savings account rather than spend it on the things we need. And two, by reducing the amount of money that we actually spend in, in an attempt to hit that target. So what we do is we put more money on a shelf and we put less money into the needs of the Commonwealth so that hopefully there's a, an ability to move forward with a reduction in our income tax. Uh, that becomes a problem, um, particularly as we have a lot of really significant needs coming up and as uh, federal money dries up. So let's move on to the next slide. Just to put that amount of money in perspective, um, uh, so th this is based off of the, the amount of money we were bringing in in 2023 uh, uh, and giving up. Um, so Medicaid is about a $2.4 billion general fund appropriation. Um, that's double what this reduction in the income tax is worth. Uh, if you compare the reduction in the income tax to, say, all of the money that we invest in post-secondary education in the state, uh, it's actually $200 million more. So it is it is not a trivial amount of money when you look at what what the needs of the Commonwealth are um, and how we actually spend those tax dollars. So let's move on to the next slide. And while you know it hurts folks like who are on Medicaid, for example, who who need health care, uh, while it hurts our public education sectors, which are economic engines of their economy, the group that this helps would be high earners. So. 65% uh, of the benefit of this tax cut goes to the top 20% of earners. Um, so that's folks who earn $105,000 or more. Um, about 20%, so one in $5 in this tax cut go to the top 1%. That's folks who earn over half a million dollars. On average, they earn about $1.4 million a year. So it is a, uh, it is a windfall to the wealthy while it is sort of crumbs for the rest of us. Let's move on to the next slide. Now, very recent news, um, we did not meet uh, the two triggers required, actually one of the two triggers required to be able to move forward with a second reduction in the income tax. Um, we've got plenty of money in our budget reserve trust fund, we've got about $3.7 billion sitting in a savings account right now, which is about a quarter of the value of the total general fund. Um, it, you know, Best practice says we only need about 15% of our general fund in savings. So that means we've got an excess of uh, about a billion and a quarter dollars um, sitting idle right now when we have a lot of needs that we should be spending that money on. Um, but we didn't bring in enough in the general fund um, to be able to meet that trigger. About 300, I'm sorry, 435,000 million, $435 million uh, less than we needed to be able to trigger that, that second um, um, uh, part of the two factor requirement for a cut. But remember, this is a this is creates constraints on how much the general fund is willing to spend. And this next year we have a budget session where we're going to decide how much we're spending moving forward. And the um, chair of the Appropriations and Revenue Committee, um, Senator McDaniel, has already said things like, we're going to have to show restraint in spending. Um, we don't need to spend all the money that we're bringing in. We're going to freeze uh, expenditures for certain items uh, at what we were spending this last year. And remember what we've been saying, uh, when when you freeze something at a certain level, kind of like with the minimum wage, it's actually a cut over time because prices go up, uh, but the dollar amount's the same. So uh, I think we really need to consider whether or not that that's wise and whether or not uh, we need to really continue to invest in, in the needs that we all have through our state budget rather than um, continuing to pursue this this attempt to zero out our income tax. So with that, we're going to pause and switch and talk about one of those budgetary needs, uh, which is child care. So uh, child care in Kentucky, I've heard described as the industry that supports all other industries. It's really good for uh, high quality education and care. It's really good for young children. It has immediate benefits for them that actually pay dividends later in life and through the rest of the society. But it's also really good for the economy, because if you don't have a safe, quality place for your kids to be, then you're less likely to want to go to a job and, and leave them there. So it's a really critical industry um, in, in our economy, and it's one that um, policy impacts greatly. So let's move on to the next slide. So half of Kentucky kids live in what's called a child care desert, and that's just a census tract where there's either three or more kids per available spot or just no spots available whatsoever. So we have a lot of our children uh, in the state who, who just don't have access to that. Now that, this data is 
all the way back from 2018. Actually, the report's from 2018. The data's from 2017. So it's actually gotten uh, worse since then. So let's move on to the next slide. Child care providers have been closing their doors for a long time in Kentucky. Now, I don't think this is unique to Kentucky, but it is especially bad here. There, we've seen a 45% decline in the number of child care providers, uh, not just spots, but actually physical locations uh, in the state. So that's uh, 1,645 fewer child care providers now uh, than in the middle of 2012. Uh, so that is a that's a really significant hit. You'll notice it kind of levels off since uh, the uh, uh, pandemic, and there's good reason for that. There was a massive influx in in federal funds that really stopped the bleeding in a lot of ways. Um, we're going to talk about that in a minute, but but really we've only been holding steady. We haven't seen a big increase over the last three years. So even if it was uh, uh, easy to find. It's still not affordable. So let's move on to the next slide. So uh, if any of you are raising kids like I am, uh, you will know that it costs about the same uh, to send your child to childcare as it does to send them to say, Western Kentucky University. Um, it is a very expensive proposition. And again, there's, there's good reason for that. We, the ratios of students to teachers are pretty low. Um, I think maybe still too <laughs> too high. For example, the ratio for uh, teachers to infants is one to six, and I can't imagine caring for two infants at a time, let alone six. Uh, so uh, you know, these are meant to cr create safe environments for our kids, to create high quality environments, but it means it's expensive. And even even though you know it's expensive for parents still really hard for centers to operate. They, they operate on razor thin margins, something like a 1% profit margin if they're turning a profit at all. Meanwhile, they're paying their teachers about $12 an hour on average, which is extremely low. It's, it's well below what a comparable position in a, in a school, a K through 12 school would be. So uh, it's expensive for the parents um, and it's difficult for the center. So to address that, we have um, a child care assistance program to try and help parents be able to afford this and to keep centers open. So let's move to the next slide. The child care assistance program uh, is just that. It is a, it's a certain amount of money that the state puts up uh, and gives to a center, which is supposed to be around um, uh, the 85th percentile of market rates. Um, parents usually put in a little bit of money as well, although that's not happening right now due to some lingering pandemic funds that the state's using to waive those copays. But we are um, slowly but surely increasing our participation. And that is by and large because of these federal funds. And I just want to point something out. You know, you all see the, the very <laughs> precipitous slide from about 40,000 kids down to below 20,000 kids over there. That was due to a, a moratorium in CCAP participation back in 2013 when we had some really significant budget problems. So uh, we opened it back up and enrollment rebounded a little bit, but it never returned to where it was before. And I, I just want to point out that, uh, like Dr. Schuster was saying earlier about elections having consequences, policy choices have consequences too. And the consequences of some of these policy choices were that we had really significant declines in participation in a program that helped everyone, kids, providers, and the economy. Uh, so we got to make sure that we continue to engage in and, and invest in these programs. Otherwise, we have situations where we lose capacity. So let's move on to the next slide. So I mentioned before we had about a billion dollars in federal investment in child care between 2020 and 2021. Um, we are still benefiting from the largest chunk of that, which was the American Rescue Plan Act, about $763 million that was split into two buckets. The first and larger one was uh, what's called a sustainability payment. These are checks that we just cut to centers, represent about $33,000 on average per center uh, per quarter. Um, and that has really helped centers just keep the lights on and maintain. It's helped some centers keep tuition down, um, keep uh, uh, wages increasing for their, their staff. Uh, and so that that has been really helpful. The second was a lot of improvements to CCAP, so increasing reimbursement rates, allowing center staff to uh, enroll in CCAP so that their kids can come with them and be watched in, at the center that they're working in, um, increasing um, eligibility for, for the folks who are uh, participating in the program. 
Um, but the bad news is that money is going away. So the sustainability payments, the federal ones at least, will run out this September. The state has announced one more uh, state-funded payment by the end of this year. And then the extra money for our child care assistance program and other improvements runs out next year. So that represents about a $300 million hole in our budget, um, at which point it's going to drop back down to uh, closer to um, $100 million in state and federal money uh, for child care, which is a really, really significant drop. And you might even call it a fiscal cliff. So let's move on to the next slide. So if and when uh, we get to that point and all of the sustainability money goes away and all the improvements to child care assistance go away, um, the Century Foundation estimates that we could lose 41 out of 41,000 out of our 160,000 spots in Kentucky, about a quarter of the spots. And remember, already half of Kentucky is a childcare desert. That means 554 businesses closing. That means a $92 million hit to um, our total earnings, which is 104 million less in employer uh, um, productivity, 3.8 million less in, in our income tax and about 3,700 jobs. That's a lot of numbers, but I want just all that to sink, sink in and just know that childcare is a vital industry. It's a linchpin industry. And if we let that run off the cliff, um, then we're facing some really dire consequences. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. Uh, so while the legislature is considering this, um, they're thinking through what they're gonna do. And there have been a lot of conversations, particularly among Danny Carroll and Samara Hevron and their joint committee for family services. Um, I think it's important just to point out that, like I said at the very beginning, this is a really critical phase for kids. It has immediate benefits and benefits that last into their adulthood. 90% of brain activity happens between the ages of zero and three. Um, and yet on the state level, we only invest about 128 bucks per kid per year. You can compare that to K through 12 where another 10% of brain development occurs. Uh, the state is putting up $2,600 a year. So, you know, I don't necessarily, I'm not advocating that we spend $2,600 per kid per year on childcare. I wouldn't oppose it. Um, but just to point out the fact that we are really, really underestimate, under investing in the most critical time in our, our lives as Kentuckians. And I think as the legislature moves forward with crafting a budget, they're considering things like further cuts to the income tax and restraints on spending, all these things. This is one of the things that they need to keep in mind. Um, and I hope that um, as you all are doing your work, uh, you will reach out to your legislators and let them know as well. So with that, I'm gonna finally hand it over uh, and uh, we'll start talking about food assistance. Thanks, Justin. Hi, I'm Jessica Klein. I'm a policy associate at Kentucky Center for Economic Policy, and I will be covering all of our food assistance programs, so pandemic EBT, SNAP, and a few updates there around work reporting requirements. Okay, so with all the cost of child care and all of our other basic needs we're talking about today, it should be no surprise that hunger is also an issue in Kentucky. Right now, about one in eight people face food insecurity in Kentucky or one in six children, and that means they lack consistent access to enough food to thrive. And we know that hundreds of thousands of our neighbors are just one lost job, missed paycheck, or medical emergency away from hunger, and that people often have to make difficult choices to pay for food or medical bills, rent, or transportation. So nobody chooses to be hungry, but rather it is a systemic problem. So I'll be talking a lot about the formal and informal programs that we use to help keep families fed. Next slide. So in this section, I'm gonna cover a few of these specific programs, but I just wanted to mention all of the important food assistance programs that we have in Kentucky that are highly utilized. So first we have the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Uh, it used to be called Food Stamps, it is now SNAP. Um, which is the, the program that provides grocery money for low-income families. We have WIC, the Women, Infants, and Children program for pregnant or breastfeeding or postpartum moms and their children under six. The National School Lunch Program, um, you might hear that called school breakfast or lunch. The Pandemic EBT program, which is in its last year this year um, because it's based on the pandemic and missed school hours, missed school lunches. And then the summer EBT program, 
which provides um, grocery money to kids that participate in the free and reduced lunch program during the summer. Next slide. So I'm going to deep dive into SNAP to get us started. Um, and this slide is to really show, uh, you know, Dustin kind of mentioned that you can see the evidence of policy decisions on participation rates. And, and this is um, a few points here. You can see that with SNAP. So a couple dips in 2016 and 2018 with policy decisions around work reporting requirements, which I'll be mentioning again um, in a few minutes. And then you can see that um, increase in 2020 with all of the supports that we've seen throughout the pandemic um, and the need, um, which really points to that SNAP works. It responds quickly during economic downturns and provides food assistance to people, which then stimulates local economies when it's spent in local grocery stores or farmers markets. Next slide. So currently it reaches over 550,000 Kentuckians. And here you can kind of see that split up by county of um, our participation rates and how much it really varies, um, about 12.3% depending on your county. Um, so the average benefit is about $158. Again, that doesn't fully cover um, our groceries, but this is a supplemental program. So it supplements your family's grocery budget. And we spent about 1.2 billion in 2022. And that again, that's money that goes directly back into farmers and grocers budgets. Next slide. Um, and yeah, and with the end of the pandemic means the end of some of the supports um, and that came with the SNAP program. So there was a, a benefit that allowed people to receive the maximum amount for their household size. That ended with the end of the public health emergency. So we really wanna make sure people are getting um, the amount of benefits that they're eligible for. So you can consider these different deductions in your SNAP calculation if you're a SNAP participant um, to make sure that you're getting the amount of um, SNAP benefits that you're eligible for. So some of those include um, deductions for dependent care costs, homeless deduction, legal child support deduction, shelter costs, utilities, and some for medical expenses as well. Um, next slide. And that brings us to the most recent policy in SNAP that's being implemented. So this is the SNAP reporting requirements for people without children or a disability between ages 18 to 49. Um, that started in July, and that was about 17,000 individuals. Recently, this has expanded to people 50 to 52. Um, so it's really expanding to 50 and 54 over the next few years. But for now, starting September 1st, there's a phase in of people to 50 to 52 as well. And what this does is require people to report their work hours in order to continue to receive their SNAP benefits. The last time this was in place between 2018 and 2020, about 30,000 Kentuckians lost food benefits. Um, so it's likely that we will see people lose their benefits during this time. So we're really trying to make sure people understand these reporting requirements and are able to report their work hours. Next slide. We do have about 39 counties that are exempted from this work reporting requirement based on their unemployment rate and other economic factors. Um, and here you can see it's all got aggregated in one area, um, but those are the counties that do not have to be subject to these work reporting requirements. Next slide. And I also wanted to mention that starting in September, there are three new exemptions for the work reporting requirements. And those exemptions are people experiencing homelessness, people aging out of foster care, and veterans. Um, so what this means is that these exemptions, um, if you submit the right information, you will be exempt from the reporting your work hours. And we recently learned that people are, um, you know, being exempted based on zero verification. You don't have to submit any paperwork. Um, and you should be exempted if you fall into one of these categories and, and um, report that change. 
So we wanted to make sure that um, people check out all of the exemptions to make sure that you are exempted if you're eligible for an exemption. And there's a link here to this beautiful Thrive Kentucky handout that you can really check out more information on exemptions there. Okay, that brings us to the pandemic EBT program in the summer. EBT program for this year. Um, again, this is the last time we'll be participating in pandemic EBT because it makes up for missed school meals during the pandemic. Um, this is specifically for the 2022 to 2023 school year for school-aged kids and kids under six. So the grocery money for kids under six on SNAP has already gone out in June and July. So the application currently open is for school-aged kids for the previous school year, and you can find that online at Connect. Um, the application is open right now, so you can receive grocery money onto a EBT card to spend at a grocery store. Um, all you need is your student's ID and any dates that they had COVID-related absences in the previous school year. So you might have to call your school district to make sure you have that information before applying. This also um, is eligible for virtual and homeschool students this year, which is new compared to previous years. They won't have to um, submit any student ID information on the application, but will have to submit some income information or um, a SNAP Medicaid or KTAP case number to make sure you're income eligible for pandemic EBT, since it's based on participation in free and reduced school lunch. And then all of those benefits should be going out by September 30th, which means there will also be a benefit going out in October, which is the summer PEBT program. So that makes up for um, grocery or grocery costs during the summer to make sure kids get fed. Um, so you, it's not summer anymore, so we're a few months behind, um, but that'll be about $120 per child that you're still eligible for. So definitely recommend that people check their um, PBT balance, even if you don't submit an application this for the past school year. Next slide. I just wanted to provide a quick update on the EBT skimming um, fix that came with the 2023 omnibus appropriation. Um, so recently we have submitted a state plan and it's been approved for um, people to be reimbursed if they've had any benefits stolen off of their EBT card. Um, so this is specifically for people who have had benefits stolen due to EBT skimming between October 2022 and September 2024. Um, we are looking for a permanent federal fix for this, but this does cover, a, you know, that specific time period um, for anybody that's had skimming um, during that time. And the, the, the images here are of an EBT card reader. Some of these have skimmed benefits. You know, this is a national issue that we're seeing. You can't tell the difference between machines. Um, and sometimes retailers don't even know that this is going on in their store or with their machines. So this is a, a national issue that we're facing. But if you've lost benefits due to skimming, be sure to report that to DCBS to get reimbursed for your food assistance. Next slide. Okay, if you are interested in advocacy around any of these food issues, you should check out um, KentuckyFoodActionNetwork.org, where you can learn more about all of the federal and state advocacy that we are doing um, around food assistance programs and around Kentucky's food system in general. We also have an upcoming annual meeting in September 14th in Louisville, so please feel free to register for that. I'll put the registration in the chat. And with that, I will turn it over back to Sheila. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. And hello again. I'm still a licensed psychologist. I have a different uh, hat on, um, represent the Advocacy Action Network, which is the Kentucky Mental Health Coalition and the 874K Disabilities Coalition. Uh, next, please, Alex. So we celebrated a very important one-year anniversary or birthday in July of this year. Uh, it was the one-year anniversary of the uh, national uh, mental health crisis or behavioral health crisis suicide prevention line, and that's the 988 line. And I hope that you all have heard about it. It's the easy way to call. We used to have to remember a 10-digit number to call the suicide prevention line. 
so much easier to call 988. And this is the information about the increases in calls. Um, I want to brag on Kentucky because of the way our community mental health centers are set up so that there's access across every one of the 120 counties. We have 13 call centers. So all of these calls that come in from a Kentucky area code are being answered locally, which is huge. So if you call 988, you're going to get somebody in Kentucky um, that's going to know local resources that it's probably going to sound like you uh, and not somebody in New Orleans or California or uh, New York. So um, there also are uh, particular uh, lines that you can push for Spanish um, and for the Trevor Project for those that are dealing with LGBTQ uh, issues. Next, please. Now, the not so good news is that we continue to have very high suicide and self-harm, <clears throat> excuse me, statistics in Kentucky. And it's across almost every age group, almost every uh, racial or ethnic background. Um, and you can see some of those here. Every time we think we're focusing on the latest one to pop up, then another group comes forward. I will say that there's been a lot of work done uh, in um, reaching out to farmers and those who are farm families. That's a group that has uh, heretofore been very uh, self-sufficient and not used to reaching out for help, but a very helpful resource is at uh, Raising Hope KY. Dot com And there's a lot of work being done to make sure that people see um, they're doing a lot of work with the youth through Future Farmers of America and a lot of outreach. And they're linking people to the 988 number. But if you are in a farm community or you're working with farm families or with farmers, uh, this is a great resource for you. Uh, the other, again, is the Trevor Project for LGBTQ use them with the, um, I'm going to call them attacks on this uh, population in the last uh, General Assembly. We're uh, increasingly concerned about uh, isolation, depression, and suicidality among those, um, particularly those youngsters. Next, please. So just a shout out to our 14 community mental health centers. You can see what areas they uh, cover. And remember that all 120 counties are associated with one of these CMHCs, and they have their own crisis line as well, so that you can uh, call directly. And many of them um, give that line, obviously, to uh, clients and people that they think may be in, um, in crisis. So don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, more than likely, your 988 call, if you call from that area code, is going to be answered by somebody at the local community mental health center. Next, please. So just a reminder that September is Addiction Recovery Month. It's also Suicide Prevention Month, but I thought it was really important to focus on our ongoing uh, and unfortunate opioid addiction problem here. So what we do in National Recovery Month is to celebrate those that are in recovery some of whom have been in recovery for uh, multiple years. Um, and we need to recommit our efforts to prevent substance use disorders and support those who are struggling and make sure that those in recovery have all that they need to live full and healthy lives. Um, there is a waiver from the cabinet to begin that treatment um, for incarcerated persons while they are still in uh, in incarceration under Medicaid, that's not been approved yet, but that's a move in the right direction, certainly. Now, there's some good news. Um, in 2022, Kentucky was one of only eight states to see a decrease in overdose deaths, and it was a decrease of uh, about 5.4 percent from 2021, the first decrease since 2018. Even still, we lost 2,135 Kentuckians and nearly 75% of those were related to fentanyl. And we're gonna talk later about some harm reduction related to fentanyl. So kids are buying pills on the market that they think are ADHD uppers, or they think are um, um, Xanax or um, those kinds of pills. And it turns out that they're laced with fentanyl and then they're dead um, because nobody around them has naloxone or 
knows to use it at the time. Uh, we're also seeing the rate of overdose deaths increasing again in 2023. So I don't think we're going to be able to see a continuing decrease, which is really unfortunate. There is a phenomenal uh, resource available here in Kentucky uh, through the uh, Kentucky Injury Prevention Center at UK. And I know the UK um, School of Public Health has had been instrumental and they work with uh, the uh, governor's office on um, um, drug enforcement. Um, so it's called findhelpnowky.org slash KY. And that gets you up to the minute resources about who actually has a treatment bed or a slot available. So there's all kinds of things you can sign up for, whether you need a, an immediate residential program, whether you need outpatient, whether you need some hybrid, which is typically called uh, partial hospitalization or intensive outpatient um, treatment. Uh, but the important thing is this is not just a blind referral to an agency, but it tells you who has let them know that day that they have beds available. They also have a helpline that's available 8.30 to 10 during the week and 8.30 to 5 where you have a specialist for screening and referral and that toll-free number is there. And then if you need help after hours, uh, you can call the Kentucky Opioid Assistance and Resource Hotline at that number. And thank you for our little uh, cursor there. Um, and you can also get help by calling 988. So lots of ways to get help. And to get help for someone that you know, it doesn't have to be for you, but if you need assistance in getting help for someone that, you're, that you care about, um, we can uh, get that for you. Um, next, uh, I mentioned the harm reduction. We want to keep people alive so we can get treatment to them. So we know that Narcan has been approved and is now available without prescription uh, through the pharmacy or through the public health uh, centers. There now is a new inhaler that's uh, proven to be even more effective and longer lasting that's been approved I'm not sure how readily available it is yet. Um, the legislature in 2023 uh, passed a very important bill, House Bill 353, to declassify possession of fentanyl test strips. So they are no longer illegal to have. They're not considered drug par paraphernalia and they are widely available. And the importance is if you know someone who is buying drugs on the street, they really need to have these strips so that they can test every pill that they buy and see whether it has any fentanyl in it. Again, we wanna keep people alive so we can get them into recovery. Next, please. So I wanna talk uh, for a minute about a waiver. This is a, a Medicaid waiver for Kentuckians with severe mental illness. And many of you know, uh, Steve Shannon, who um, is executive director of the Comp Care Centers um, Association for 12 of the 14 and I, have been working for about 20 years to try to get this. Um, I, I will bring you down to where we are right now. We are waiting for notification from the cabinet that they have an SMI, severe mental illness, 1915I waiver, ready to roll out for our comments. And they are planning to have an announcement in uh, September about town hall meetings across the state. We have not gotten that information. I met with Secretary Friedlander uh, last week and asked, and he was gonna check on that because we need input from all of the voices, the consumers, the families, providers, and advocates. What this would do is to get um, uh, supported housing, which would uh, uh, be 24 seven, 365 days a year for as long as it's needed by the individual to make sure that they are taking their medication and getting to their appointments and then ready to move on into other housing um, supports. It also will have a supported employment piece. So we are very anxious to for DMS, to, uh, Kentucky Medicaid Services to roll that out and uh, for us to have an opportunity to see it in public and to comment on it, after which they will submit it to uh, CMS in DC for their approval. Uh, next. 
So there are another set of waivers, and I know this is sounds like alphabet and numeric soup, but there are what we call 1915C waivers, and they've been around for a long time, for over the past 30 years. So you might have heard of them as the home and community-based waivers. Uh, there's one that's called the Michelle P. waiver. There's one that's called the um, Supports for Community Living, or SCL waiver. And these are waivers for people that have severe developmental, intellectual, and physical needs and need these services to be able to live in the community and not have to go to an institution. So I wanna point out that we have more than 12,700 individuals on waiting lists for these waivers. Some of them have been on those waiting lists for literally for years. They signed their child up when the child shortly after the child was born and was given a diagnosis that would indicate uh, significant um, developmental and intellectual disabilities. Those uh, waivers are typically funded at 50 um, new slots or placements in each of those waivers a year. At that rate, it would take between 22 and 168 years, if you could imagine, to accommodate all of the people who are waiting for a placement. So there are uh, groups of organizations and um, uh, very unhappy uh, family members and advocates who want to see the General Assembly really uh, take stock and address this issue. And if you're interested in being involved, it's called ARMS, Advocates Reforming Medicaid Services. You can uh, email me at kyadvocacy at gmail.com for more information. We welcome your voice and your energy on this uh, important issue. And next. So just a reminder to take good care of yourselves and those who you love. All of us are very busy. All of us are in kind of demand um, professions and jobs and uh, avocations. And uh, we take on the worries and, and uh, concerns of the people around us. And very often we're not paying enough attention to our own mental health. So some things to look for in terms of changes in the way that you or someone that you love or someone that you're working with is acting that might be a, a sign that they are um, overly stressed or depressed, uh, having PTSD or having difficulty um, in maintaining their equilibrium. And if those symptoms pers persist, I always recommend that you check in with your um, primary care provider about your symptoms or concerns, or sometimes with a trusted friend or colleague to get some feedback about what you're seeing. There are screenings available also. Mental Health America has screenings for a number of sets of uh, symptoms that can give you kind of a guideline about whether uh, it's a good time to reach out uh, to talk to somebody. And I always say, when in doubt, reach out for help. It's much better to catch a problem early on and to get some help in dealing with it than to let it grow and fester and uh, become a, a much bigger problem to deal with. So uh, I wish you all good mental health. And I'll turn it over to uh, my friend, Adrian to talk about housing. Thanks, Dr. Schuster. This is Adrian Bush with the Homeless and Housing Coalition of Kentucky. And next slide, please. Okay, so I'm really glad that Dr. Schuster gave her mental health update if, you, um, and, and has tips and tricks because I've got some not so great news um, that probably needs, you know, needs us to, um, <laughs> to be in a good mental space. Um, so on the federal appropriations update, it, I know you have probably hearing, been hearing some rumblings um, and we pay very close attention to this in the housing world because um, all of most of the housing funding coming into Kentucky comes from the federal non-defense discretionary side of the budget. So right now we have a problem, and that is that the government's current year funding is going to end in less than a month and that there is no agreement in place yet for the new year that begins October 1st. So we have a couple of options. Um, one is that there could be a continuing resolution, and the other could be that the government just shuts down. 
And so if this is something that you have, you would like your Congress members to take action on, um, we have a sign on letter um, linked in the slide deck just for you. Next slide. Okay, so this, my section is going to talk about funding on one hand and then policy on the other, um, kind of back and forth. Over the summer, there have been some federal anti-housing first developments, and we're going to start at the federal level and then move from the down to the state and the local um, governments as well. But at the federal level, we have Congressman Andy Barr from Kentucky has reintroduced a bill um, that really takes aim at the housing first model in homeless services. Currently HUD prioritizes a housing first approach and its awarding of housing grants for homeless service providers. And that's because Congress tells them to, they need to prioritize evidence-based solutions of which housing first is. Quick clarification, housing first is not housing only. True Housing First programs promote stable housing first with, with, with wraparound services. This bill would require HUD to dilute its homelessness funding to include programs that only provide temporary accommodations for compliant recovery participants. Next slide. Okay, first of all, I just wanna say I'm not anti-recovery over here. We just spent a significant amount of time talking about how important recovery is. Our perspective as housing advocates is you have funding streams that are appropriate for housing and you have funding streams that are appropriate for recovery and they should stay in their lanes. A recovery housing program that is also through HUD is already available and being used in Kentucky specifically for this population. It is funded by Representative Barr's legislation from 2018. It's appropriate. It's very much needed. The Anti-Housing First Bills approach has already been tried to address or reduce homelessness in the 1980s, the 1990s, and the early 2000s, where it did little to actually reduce homelessness because the cause at the community level and at the state level of homelessness is unaffordable housing. This bill has not yet been heard in the House Financial Services Committee. And lastly, just want to reiterate this, we should fund evidence-based recovery programs, but not with the limited amount of permanent housing money that Congress appropriates. Next slide. Okay, switching gears. Over the summer, we talked about the Federal Housing Finance Administration request for input on tenant protections. Just wanted to give a quick update that the comment period closed with 3,500 comments nationwide and a really strong showing from Kentuckians. So we're excited to see what new policy developments come um, in the multifamily housing market because of this. Next slide. All right, combination of federal and state update. We have the housing assistance fund that was funded by the American Rescue Plan Act that is still operational in Kentucky. Next slide. It is $85 million to help homeowners who are behind on their mortgage. You can see from the Kentucky Housing Corporation, which administers the fund across all 120 counties, that they are about a quarter of the way obligated. So there's still plenty of money. So if you know of anyone who would qualify for this, come and get your money. Next slide. All right, federal disaster housing update, because we still have our on, we're still recovering from our disasters. Um, so for the 22 floods, as we have talked about, there is community development block grant disaster recovery money that has not yet been allocated. We know that the total amount is 298 million for Eastern Kentucky for the floods. That is not all housing specific. A portion of it is going to go towards housing. The plan is still currently under development at the Department for Local Government. Once that, that plan is released, there will be a public comment period. But in the meantime, they still have a survey for residents to complete. Okay, so our legislature did take action and provided some very much needed bridge funding um, between when FEMA assistance dried up and when CDBGDR 
finally ever becomes available. And so $10 million went to Eastern, $10 million went to Western. The advisory committee has been convened by Kentucky Housing Corporation and will meet again in November. The applications for developers closed on September 1st. Potentially, if funding remains a second um, round, will open up later in the fall. Once that funding is awarded, then the developers will then allow for household applications as folks are eligible. Next slide. All right. Going strictly to the state and funding, we have our state affordable housing trust fund. And the governor did come to the Kentucky Affordable Housing Conference in Lexington two weeks ago and proposed using state dollars for more affordable housing in Kentucky. Obviously, this is something that we would definitely support. And this is what was interesting to me was he talked about connecting the dots between needing additional housing in the context of additional economic development activity. If we already have a shortage and we have additional jobs and more people are in the workforce, we need to be thinking about both our current housing needs and our future ones. Lastly, we do encourage everyone to ask all your candidates in all races about funding housing. Next slide. Okay. And then we talked about anti-housing first criminalization at the federal level. We've got some trends that are closer to home. I'm gonna start on this slide from the bottom right and then move counterclockwise. So we have seen a rise of unsheltered homelessness. You have seen this chart in previous webinars with the point in time counts. And you can see that generally homelessness was declining, 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 and then it has kind of bounced back up since the pandemic. And part of the reason of that is because rents have like skyrocketed over the past few years, right? So we've had a number of pandemic assistance programs. Those have dried up to the general population. And so what we are seeing is more unsheltered homelessness. In Louisville, there's been a lot of community discussion about people experiencing unsheltered homelessness in camps. The current mayoral administration's um, approach towards public and community safety and a number of sweeps that have occurred over the past mm, eight months or so. Courier Journal has a very interesting article today. I encourage you to check it out. Um, we adhere to the principles of the housing not handcuffs campaign. What we are starting to see is new cut and paste legislation um, is starting to take hold in other states like Missouri, Texas, Tennessee, um, and potentially could be introduced in Kentucky. And so these are some of the elements, which would be a statewide camping ban, diversion of all federal and state funding for homeless services from evidence-based housing and services or the housing first approach to short-term state-run encampments and emergency shelters. Lowering of due process protections to involuntarily commit people experiencing homelessness and creation of homeless outreach teams funded by homelessness dollars which require law enforcement to force unhoused people into state-run encampments under threat of arrest. So none of this is I don't have like a bill draft right here in front of you. I don't have a call to action other than be aware of what your community is doing. Talk to your legislators about what housing does for folks, both at the individual and the community level, and always reach out to us with any questions or concerns. And with that, I will turn it over to Emily. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So I'm just going to very briefly talk to you about the um, public comment period for the new community health worker regulation, which uh, covers Medicaid billing. So now um, I've, I've um, shared this information on previous calls. Com certified community health workers um, can now bill Medicaid for certain services, which is fantastic news. Um, I put sort of in parentheses because it 
unfortunately it doesn't apply to every certified community health worker right now um, for a number of reasons. And um, I think that the regulation has some work um, to be done before it, it can really um, help us to not only, um, you know, make reimbursement practical and realistic for CHWs, but also really help us to grow our network of certified community health workers in Kentucky, which is the real goal, um, making sure that more Kentuckians have access to that kind of support in their communities from people they trust. So what you see on this slide is just really um, informational. So if you want to learn more about the bill that was passed to um, direct the cabinet to do this, and uh, any of the information about the regulation itself. It's all here. And comments are being accepted between now and September 30th. And I have the email address on this slide where you can submit your comments. On the next slide, um, you can see six ways that we at Kentucky Voices for Health have identified um, to improve CHW billing. So the first is to remove a prohibition on grant funding. The prohibition is essentially that if CHWs are receiving grant funding um, in the regulation, it says federal, but in an FAQ, it, it, it is more expansive than that. It says state, private, or federal funding. Then um, the, the CHW wouldn't be able to participate in Medicaid billing. That doesn't, um, a similar prohibition doesn't apply to any other Medicaid provider or any other Medicaid service. Um, but of course there is a prohibition on double billing. You can't bill for something that's been paid for by other funds. And we find that to be you know, absolutely acceptable. We just don't wanna hold CHWs to a different standard and make it harder for CHWs to participate. And what we want to see is that CHWs can bill Medicaid for Medicaid patients who are receiving their services and use grant funds to cover non-Medicaid patients and services that aren't billable to Medicaid. So that is, I think, the biggest change that would make the biggest difference. Um, and really, it's relatively a minor change on the part of the cabinet. So the second way is to provide flexibility on the number of units that CHWs are allowed to bill for. Right now, the limit is two a week and 104 for the year, and each unit is for 30 minutes of service. So that would be an hour a week. Um, we think that there should be more flexibility, and for higher need, higher acuity patients, um, also perhaps a higher limit. Um, the third is to allow community-based organizations, local nonprofits, um, to participate by contracting with an eligible Medicaid provider if they don't already have a provider on staff, which many don't. Uh, but they do often have CHWs on staff because, you know, the nature of community health work is that um, CHWs are working in the communities that they live in and serve. Um, number four, allow Medicaid providers to operate community hubs. And I link to a, a good model that's evidence-based that can provide administrative support and clinical oversight um, needed for CHWs who aren't already employed directly by a Medicaid provider. There are a number of states doing this, and um, I think it would be really beneficial here in Kentucky. The fifth is to allow social workers to participate as billing providers. So that would include the licensed clinical social workers and licensed professional um, clinical counselors. And uh, right now they are excluded. A state plan amendment ask, essentially asking CMS for approval is what would be needed to change that. And then the last is to reimburse same day services provided at federally qualified health centers, rural health clinics and certified uh, community behavioral health centers by incorporating the cost of CHW system services into a wrap payment. And this is complicated, but wrap payments are essentially looking at the cost of care for numerous services um, because these types of facilities are just reimbursed a little differently than most providers um, or by using the fee schedule. So you could get one wrap payment a day plus fee schedule for your CHWs. So all of that is something that we are outlining now in comments that KBH is going to be submitting. And we'll be sharing those comments before September 30th, probably later this week um, with everyone on this call and um, all of the community health workers that we have um, you know, contact information for. Uh, and you are welcome to take those and use them as you see fit and build on them. And uh, hope we're hoping that uh, many CHWs and CBOs and providers will be um, submitting comments. So any questions, um, I'm happy to try to answer, but I'm gonna turn it over now to Priscilla to give us an update on Medicaid renewals. Hello everyone, um, happy Tuesday. 
Um, I'm Crystal Easterling, and I'm going to cover Medicaid renewals and special enrollment today, special enrollment periods today. Next slide, please. So since last month, we don't have updated data for August yet, um, but just a continual reminder that Medicaid renewals restarted back in April 1, and they will run through April 2024. So it's super important that folks update their contact information on Connect. Um, if you need any help uh, filling out, uh, updating that contact information, reach out to connectors, um, and members can also expect to receive uh, letters and calls from, these, uh, from the Department of Medicaid Services and from their MCOs. Uh, so there's lots of information going out. Make sure that your address is updated so you receive those notices. If your information is not updated, you might not receive those notices. And if you don't receive those notices and you don't respond, people could lose their coverage. So that's really important. Um, there are a lot of great unwinding resources available on the state's website, medicaidunwinding.ky.gov. Um, um, and there are Spanish translations of communications and other documents available on the website as well. Um, and a couple of great uh, resources as well from our friends at KY Policy sort of explaining all the things that are going on. KBH, uh, we also have a Medicaid renewal explainer that's available in English and Spanish. And um, you can always check your Medicaid renewal days in the system. So you can check the Connect self-service portal. You can call the Connect hotline. Uh, you can find a connector and a connector can find your renewal date for you. Um, and you can also ask your doctor or provider to check KY Health Net portal um, at uh, Dr. Smith. Next slide, please. So as we've mentioned before, every member is receiving one of three notices during this time through April 2024. Um, those three notices, one is a notice of eligibility. That means that folks have been passively renewed. And so they'll just say, hey, we checked your information. You're good for another 12 months of coverage. Here you go. Um, for uh, some other folks, they'll say, hey, they'll try and check your information, but need they'll need a little bit more from folks, um, whether that's updated income information or income documentation. Um, and you'll just uh, it'll have a big green banner across the top that says we need information. So you'll just need to submit the documents that they request by the due date that's listed, um, and then the state will make a determination. The other packet, is, uh, the other document is called a Medicaid renewal packet, and it'll say across the top, Medicaid renewal, we need information from you. Um, and that is a pre-populated document that has all of the case information on the uh, all of the case information that the state has and members just have to go through and make sure that it's up to date. If there are any changes to make, you just note them on that document and then you can either mail fax or um, mail or fax them back in or take them into the office directly. Um, perfect. So as of um, the end of as of the end of July, there were 269,000, uh, almost 270,000 individuals. And this is not case level data individuals who went through the Medicaid renewal process. Of that 270,000, 130, almost 137,000 of them were approved and all, a little over 80,000 of them were terminated. And most of them, uh, almost 48,000, were terminated for procedural reason, which, which means that they did not respond to a notice. That's a pretty big percentage, so we wanna make sure 59% of the terminations have been for from people who did not respond to those notices. So it's super important that when folks receive those notices, you submit the requested documents, you turn in that Medicaid renewal packet, um, it don't let, don't not act and lose your coverage. Um, make sure that the state is the final, it makes that final determination for you. Don't just assume that you're not eligible. This is also really important because adults and children have differing eligibility lines. So adult, it's really common that adults may not be eligible in the household anymore, but the kids likely still will be. So it's really important to submit this document. All right, let's, next slide. This is a beautiful visual representation of that same data. Um, again, let's move forward. Okay, so once you receive that notice, um, asking for information, the first thing to do is to report any changes on your case. So if your job has changed, if your address has changed, if anything in your household has changed in the last three years, it's so important to log into Connect 
uh, and make sure to update that information. If you don't have a connect, account, a connect account, you can reach out to a connector and they can do that for you, or you can always call the call center and have them update it for you. Sort of a big caveat that I'll say, if you call the call center, expect a wait time. We're hearing really long wait times, uh, two or three hours at some time. Sometimes people are getting disconnected. So I, I would push you towards uh, reaching out to a connector or doing the, or uploading it yourself. Um, but that is still an option if you want to do that. And you can also go into the office directly and they'll make those changes. If you are terminated from your coverage because you did not turn in a notice, you didn't respond, you didn't realize that you lost your coverage until you went to the doctor's office or pharmacy to pick up something, um, you have a 90-day reconsideration period. So from the loss of coverage, um, from the day of loss of coverage, you can submit your documents and DMS, if they determine that you're still eligible, they can re-enroll you or reinstate coverage back to the day of the loss of coverage so that there's no gap in, in, no gaps in coverage. Uh, if you go through that, if you upload your documents and the state says, hey, we're, you're still not eligible and you think that you might still be, you have the right to request an appeal. So you have 120 days from the day of uh, from the date of that loss or from the date of the determination to request a fair hearing. So uh, that is also right. If you are not, if you think that you're still eligible, definitely, definitely file an appeal. Next slide, please. So the state uh, has a monthly meeting where they go over these, uh, goes over the data um, and answer any questions. You can submit those questions ahead of time if you want to just hear from the state directly how things are going, um, any sort of data updates or changes that they're going to be making. Those meetings are on the third month of each, the third Thursday of each month at 11 a.m. Uh, the link is right there. Um, and they also post the, me the those meetings on their website. So um, if you miss the meeting, you can always go back and catch up if you, you know, are very interested. And they also post the presentation slides that they go over and any frequently asked questions. They have a, a pretty comprehensive data uh, document. So any of those questions that are submitted ahead of time, they answer them and also add them to that uh, FAQ as well that's so posted on the website. So great resource as well. Next slide. So we are hearing a lot of uh, issues that have been coming up for folks as they've been trying to go through this process. Um, you know, we heard a lot about folks who are enrolled in waivers, getting termination letters, folks with a, a active SSI going through the renewal process at all. Um, folks with active SSI should be passively renewed and should not have to take any action to keep their Medicaid. So that's a problem. Some folks have been terminated who have SSI. Um, another big thing are duplicate notices. Um, you've submitted documents, they, you went to the office, you faxed them in, you uploaded them on uh, Connect, and you're still getting a termination notice. Those notices will say uh, fail, uh, terminated for failure to respond or submit those requested documents. Um, if you already know, hey, I did that, um, that's definitely you want to reach out to a connector because the connector can uh, will reach out to the state and make sure that your coverage is reinstated. Um, if you've submitted those documents, your coverage should be pending until the state makes a final determination about your eligibility. Um, if that if you get a termination notice and you know you submitted something, definitely definitely reach out to a connector. You can also call the call center, but again, just be prepared for a bit of a wait. Um, if you, there are a lot of other issues and just in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go over all of them, um, but there are a lot of other issues that we're hearing. If you know of someone who's having problems going through this process or have lost their coverage or you know um, didn't receive a notice or they're just confused about the process, reach out to a connector, but you can also reach out directly to me. I am, I am collecting all of this case information and reporting it directly to the state. Um, they have been really great about working with us um, directly to sort of manually fix any cases that we report. And so it's really important for us that uh, folks to maintain their eligibility and maintain their coverage. So if you know of anyone who has any difficulties, definitely reach out to me directly and I'm happy to connect you with someone. Um, and we also, uh, there's also for outreach and enrollment professional, there's also a post on KY Loop where we're cataloging that information. So you can sort of uh, share your experience with folks and hear from other people around the state to see if they're experiencing the same thing. Um, this Thursday, September 7th at 9 a.m., we are hosting, we're actually hosting a town hall forum. 
um, with the state. So representatives from DMS, KHPE, the OATS functional team, eligibility team, and other CHFS leadership will listen to outreach and enrollment professionals just to hear more about some of the issues that we're all experiencing. Um, we did send an advanced list of some of the issues that folks have reported to us directly already. And so the state will be prepared to sort of address that or you know, have some feedback about that. Um, but there will also be a space to report any other issues. Um, what are you seeing? What's going on for the folks that you're working on? It's a really great opportunity to just share directly to the state so that they can understand what people are experiencing as they're going through this renewal process. Um, we're not really sharing this on social media, but and we're limiting to professionals assisting Medicaid renewals. Uh, specifically assisting with Medicaid renewal specifically. Um, we want this to be sort of a safe and confidential space to ask questions and share issues directly, but we definitely encourage connectors, DHWs, legal aid, and all other folks who are doing any sort of assistance with Medicaid renewals to please join us and attend. There's a register now link uh, if you are interested. Right, next slide. Um, and then a perennial, if folks lose their coverage, if they lose their Medicaid, there are other ways to get coverage. We don't want folks to just suddenly be uninsured. Make sure that you get uh, get connected to a connector who can help you enroll in a, qualify, uh, in a qualified health plan through the marketplace. There's payment assistance that's available. Um, and you know we wanna make sure that people remain insured. Okay, next slide. Perfect. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Priscilla. Um, and. 90 minutes flies by every time. Thank you all for hanging in there with us. I'm not going to go over the resources, but just know it's there. If you want to look for some of the resources we talked about today, you'll get that follow-up email that I um, promised you before, along with an evaluation. We'd love for you to take and give us your feedback. And hopefully we'll see you, if not, at one of our roadshow stops um, next month on our next webinar. So thanks again, everybody. Have a good afternoon.